Welcome to the Green Market Summit. We're here to talk about the economics of cannabis. I know everyone is really, really excited about cannabis, and we're going to turn it way down and talk about compliance, <laughs> which is, you know, coming to a cannabis convention and talking about compliance is a lot like flicking on Comedy Central and finding C-SPAN. And you just kind of, <laughs> I, I wanted three amigos, and you guys are talking about soy tariffs? Uh, no, thank you. Anyways, uh, just quick rundown, our panel, uh, furthest away from me, bookending our little row, is Aaron Lachant. He's the founder of MMLG. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> to Aaron's immediate left is the wonderful Dr. Julie Crockett. She's MMLG's Director of Compliance. To Julie's left is Perry Nelson, the founding partner of Nelson Hardeman, one of the country's leading healthcare law firms. And immediately to Harry's left is Clint Armstrong, the founder of Skillset, as well as the founder of Growstaff. Clint just did a TED Talk. Guys, let's talk a little bit about investment and regulatory risk. And maybe even before that, let's touch a, li touch a little bit about what compliance entails in cannabis. Because it's a term that's thrown a lot, thrown around a lot in a lot of highly regulated industries, but in cannabis, it, it seems to be go even deeper. So Aaron, do you want to lead? Sure. I, I mean, compliance and, and cannabis is, is multi-level, and it's going to be like the foundation of any successful cannabis company. At, at, at a high level, you, you have things like tax compliance and IE-280E, but you're also dealing with operational compliance, which is really going to make or break your company because folks, we, we're seeing a lot of folks who are making large investments in cannabis companies and it, it's operational compliance all the way down to the lowest level employee that, that can make or break your business. Um, and under most states regulations, you know, the, the, uh, the licensee is responsible for the acts of their employees. So it, it's com completely you know, the goal of every cannabis company to be instilling this culture of compliance from the top all the way down if the enterprise is going to be successful. One of the common things that's been shared a lot at a lot of the recent events that I've been to for the past couple years, especially in California, is it's common for people to say this is no longer the cannabis industry, this is now the compliance industry because that is the main um, term and method of engagement at all levels. And I, I also think that it's, compliance is such a giant word right now where it's almost like saying math, you know, <laughs> where it's like, what do you mean by that? Are you talking about algebra? Are you talking about geometry? Where there's a lot of gradations in terms of what uh, facet of compliance are you talking about because it is so comprehensive and essential to all aspects of operation. Um, I mean, like, the only thing I'd add is, you know, I think when you, when you start talking, like, you, like to your comment, um, compliance is often thought of as like a grudge purchase, like, ugh, I have to, this is something I have to take care of. What we've seen, you know, we've, I mean, I think what, what, what I can say is that we've been in this a decade now, and we've seen these rolling waves where different players get, just get taken out because they haven't been paying attention to it. So you have two choices. You can see it as a, as a ugh, this is like the minimum I have to do, or given the uncertainty, given that we're still learning how the state agencies and local agencies are policing what they care about, and then this big question of what the federal government is going to be doing behind it, you can say, you know what, this is a strategic imperative. If my business is going to be one of those ventures that's still going to be there a decade forward and is going to be a leader, you can actually invest in this and make this a driving, uh, a driving factor in your success. Yeah, I, I think that something that a lot of people miss out on is that the smartest investment you can make for your business is into compliance, right? Where it's the best way to ensure that you're going to be around in a decade. Uh, Clint, I know that you have done a lot of work in terms of compliance with payroll and things like that in terms of training. So what do you think, from a compliance standpoint, are some of those bigger issues in terms of payroll, taxes, workers' comp? Sure. I think that uh, what you really want to do is, is, in terms of investing in, compli in compliance is investing in actually your staff and training your staff in compliance. And by doing that, you're taking actually a really proactive approach 
rather than a reactive approach. And you can see this in all different areas of your business, whether it's accounting and finance and dealing with the actual cash management of your business or the workers' compensation and dealing with the actual liability and you know, the actual workers, if they get injured on the job, what do you do about that? And do you actually have your illness injury prevention programs in place and maintaining and making sure that your actual lockout tagout procedures on your equipment are in place and that your, your actual chemical distributions and everything is basically properly handled so that you're fully compliant in the event that government does come in like OSHA and the different regulatory agencies to actually see what you're currently doing. That's a really good point about regulation in terms of local, state, OSHA. Right. And OSHA, I mean, that's a federal entity that still is touching. Federal and. Yeah, and state level OSHA. Is that and they're always going to ask you and actually look at your processes to see what you're actually doing. How are you actually extracting? How are you actually growing and cultivating? How are you actually distributing the actual cannabis? Taking a step back, um, what do you guys think from an investment standpoint are some of the most important priorities from a re regulatory and compliance standpoint? Aaron, I know that you've done a lot of work with this in terms of M&A, in terms of investment. Yeah, so you know, it, it's interesting. A lot of the deals we see, folks are, are rightly so, are, are very much focused on um, the financial side of things determining potential tax liability that may be out there and audit risk with I-280E. And, and that's huge because with I-280E, a lot of retailers definitely do have a lot of financial exposure that's out there. <laughs> but Thank you, Julie. <laughs> one area we, we often you know, see people missing is the regulatory risk. It, it's almost like people are way too excited to close the deal mm -hmm. and, and finally get their seat at the cannabis table that they forget to take a look at operations and see what sort of risk might be out there with regards to a company's past operation. And, and a lot of times, you know, regulatory compliance when you're on the investor side, if things aren't done properly from the, the previous owners, mm -hmm. it can turn into a money pit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I like to point to manufacturers. I, I think in, in California, manufacturers have like the highest um, standards as far as like quality control for product manufacturing and and we've we've seen a number of folks who have rushed out there to buy an interest in a manufacturing business only to realize that you know good man, manufacturing practices weren't implemented uh, the building wasn't built out to the building code and that great deal that they got now, they're now looking at you know six figures of build out and and you know planning out the facility so that it does meet regulatory requirements. It, I, I think it's really important to pay attention to the financial side because obviously dollars and cents drive these businesses, but the regulatory risk you know, can lead to big costs down the road. And, and you could also you know, be inheriting someone's mess. Uh, one, one other area we see a lot of problems with is record keeping. Uh, a lot of legacy operators don't have the um, systems in place to keep, uh, you know, seven years worth of records like states mandate. And so as an investor, when you're coming in buying somebody's existing business, you know, one of the things you're looking at is, do they have the records in place? Do they have the systems in place? Or am I buying into somebody's, you know, regulatory mess that they created three years ago? And just to tag on to that record keeping requirement in a lot of states like California, it's not just that you have to have these records, it ha it's that you must be able to immediately produce them when they're asked for them. So it, it isn't just a matter of that you have a database somewhere, it's that your staff is trained enough and everybody who's there can actually locate something that's requested by an agency who has a tendency to show up unannounced and say, hey, we want to spot check this aspect of your business. And if you can't respond to one of those requests when the full you know, strength of enforcement is, is, is in place, you know, every single um, failure on a record keeping request is a $30,000 fine. Now, now, guys, wait a minute. This, uh, <laughs> this sounds like fear mongering. And we're talking to a room full of investors, and we want them to be excited about cannabis, OK? <laughs> we don't want to be, you know, I'm kidding, sort of. <laughs> But uh, what do you guys think of, from a regulatory and compliance standpoint, what are some of the benefits for a business when you're looking at compliance? What, what, are, what are some of the best 
sort of case studies or examples, Aaron, Julie, Harry, Clint, whomever, that you guys have seen in terms of a company using compliance to their advantage to stay ahead of trouble? Well, I, I think it was already said, you know, you were, compliance should be proactive rather than reactive. And, and yep. I think one of the best case studies is this company out of California called Candescent. They're a, a, a cultivator flower brand. And, and they're just a, a, you know, a company who was ahead of the curve with every single rule change. Uh, I remember last July, you know, folks were operating in California, and, and then an article comes up on MJ Biz Daily saying, hey, there's lab testing requirements now, there's new packaging requirements, and, and folks are, are having a fire sale to get rid of everything before their product becomes non-compliant. Candescent was one of those companies that you know, took compliance proactively. They, they had the right testing done ahead of time. They had the right packaging in place ahead of time. So as a result, after that July 1st deadline, you know, their product was on every single store shelves while everybody else was being thrown away after the date. Um, you know, when, when rules are changing so quickly, if you have a proactive compliance team, it, it really allows you to have a strong space in the marketplace. I, I would just add to that that we get, um, you know, every week I get a couple of phone calls from, you get a, a, a pro problems come up in, the, in businesses, right? There are going to be accusations. There's, there's a whole stream of lawyers. I was with a lawyer Saturday night, and he, uh, he said to me, you know, I had my first wage an hour. This is a lawyer who sues for not paying overtime, not giving rest to meal breaks. He said, I had my first case with a... Uh, a, a, a cannabis business, and uh, they paid. They wanted to pay me off in cash. And he goes, you know what that tells me is there's a lot more. <laughs> there's a lot more opportunity here. So there's a lot of forces coming at you. And I can tell you, as a lawyer, when we get these calls, they filter very quickly. They bifurcate into the cases where people have the records, have the process, and the, and they're small complaints. And then you have the ones that are big ones. Um, and it's it's often like heartbreaking, candidly. Like you work you work with uh, entrepreneurs building ventures, yeah. and to see them. Uh, fall on on stupid technical things that they didn't pay attention to is just a um, it's just a, a, a unnecessary and it and, and it, it doesn't happen if you invest in this area. No, I, oh, oh, go ahead, Clint. Yeah, I was, I was, I was just going to say just to add in on that, I think that the cannabis industry can really learn from other industries, uh, particularly the TPS model, the Toyota Production System model, and continuous improvement and developing Kaizen programs and pokey events. These are a, these are systems that have been systematically grown over the decades by other companies that make them highly, highly compliant and make them extremely well at quality assurance and making sure that they find immediately the, the, the main issue with whatever uh, manufacturing system within that day so that you don't have a ton of product out there that's not going to be contaminated. And so I think that we can look at other areas and other industries and actually learn from them from a compliance aspect. Julie, what do you think are some of the main sort of factors or components of compliance done right? And how do you think, you know, to Clint's, part, to Clint's point about TPS, about the TPS system where it's just continual improvement, what do you see as the necessary components and how do they continually evolve? I mean, I think we're in such an interesting place. It's, it's important to remember in all the enthusiasm and, and open-mindedness that we're experiencing right now that, in effect, we're kind of just coming out of prohibition and, and not even fully out of it yet. Uh, prohibition was, I think, settled back <laughs> a, a few decades ago. <laughs> for something, JK, JK. not for this. Uh, so, so there really is, I mean, I do feel like a lot of the operators and, and people along the supply chain are in this trust building exercise with each other, with agencies, with the state, with the federal government. You know, it's, it's a very um, interesting evolution that for so long people in the cannabis industry were saying, oh, we just want to be treated like every other industry. And it's kind of that one of those, be careful what you ask for, because now you're being treated like every other industry simultaneously, where yeah. it's, it's, you're being treated like a pharmaceutical company, you're being treated like a nutraceutical company, you're being treated like an alcohol company, like everything's kind of coming, coming to roost. Um, so, so one of the, the difficulties, I think, with a lot of these businesses, when we were talking about record keeping, that for legacy operators and people who have been doing this for a long time, you're coming out of uh, an environment where you never wanted to put anything on paper and you didn't keep any records because that was the way that you, you handled things. 
to you know immediately reporting your uh, activities to the government, which is uh, which is a big phase shift for people. Mm -hmm. And then while creating these um, processes and these networks, it's uh, doing so under these states of extreme scrutiny and also s with still evolving rules. Right. So there is a lot of, I mean, one of the things that's, that's very critical at this time, um, like Aaron was saying with Candescent, is this ability to look forward in terms of what, not just responding to the rules as they are, but having a real sense of what the rules are going to be. So for a lot of those packaging companies or people who were doing their labeling who were shocked by the, by the change of rules in California, for example, on July 1st, if they had looked at federal standards, if they had looked at California weights and measure standards for any consumer product, you would have been able to predict ahead to like, I can look at a Pepsi bottle in my house and tell you what's supposed to be on a label. So now with that being said, what do you think are some of the key components of a, a well thought out compliance plan? Yeah. So, so yeah. We don't have to reinvent the model because it exists, right? By the way, just for historical record, Compliance, we first see the term compliance in 1992 show up in the federal sentencing guidelines. What happened was companies that were repeat offenders of, in these corruption cases, these defense contractors and other companies, the government started saying, hey, wait a second, you, you're claiming this is just one rogue bad actor and that you're really a, a well-run company. Uh, prove it to us by having a compliance program. So the government came up with seven elements um, that are, were basically intended to show transparency, accountability, and integrity. And those elements were Compliance being driven by, lead, by senior leadership, meaning that from the top down, this has to be messaged appropriately. There have to be personnel uh, who are liaison so that information gets to the head of the company uh, and, and that everything's dealt with. There have to be clear rules, policies, and procedures. There has to be training of staff on those policies and procedures. There has to be enforcement of the policies and procedures. And there has to be a continuing look at, at what's going on and self-auditing so you're not waiting for the government to show up. So those are, we don't have to, you know, you can look at this, as Julie says, industry by industry. The pharmaceutical industry was, was, was forced into this. Um, and now you can go on the website of Amgen or any of these other large pharmaceuticals, and what you'll see is their whole compliance structure, how it runs, how the committee on their board reports, uh, reports on these issues. Uh, all the, you know, all, everything is transparent, and that's what this industry has to do. The challenge here is we're in new territory, so there's more work to put those rules together, I mean, that's a lot of the work that MMLG does uh, is because it's not, it, it's, it, this is fast moving and complicated, but you, you've got to, uh, to Julie's point, you've got to be on this in the same way that every other, this is not, the, the, the legality may be changing, but the structure that, that exists uh, that this is going to have to fit into, we already know we, already, what, it's, it's what it is. Yeah. Clint, what do you think from a training standpoint? Harry mentioned that leadership is so in, into, integral to compliance, but then it also comes down to on a business by business, at a business level, ensuring that your staff knows what they're doing. And exactly. with Grow Staff, you guys, you, you look at this a, quite a bit. All the time. And it really starts uh, once you hire an employee. And what you want to do is you actually want to be transparent by building out the actual job requisition for that individual. And what that's going to do for you, that's going to allow you to add all the different job duties that they're doing and the different type of equipment and processes and items that they're going to be dealing with. And this is going to transcend into your 280E expenses. This is going to allow you to become much better and more profitable because you actually have these different light items uh, that this individual is doing. And by doing that, you're becoming more compliant. And then you can also go ahead and train other employees in those processes and procedures to make sure that you're fully compliant and intertwined with your different you know, illness injury prevention programs while you're manufacturing and your SOPs as well. Aaron, you've talked a lot, or you've seen a lot of non-compliance matters as well. Uh, based in Los Angeles, you've been in the game since 2009. Uh, can you speak to the costs of non-compliance? I know that everyone in the room is probably very curious about what happens if you know the money they've invested, and it, it Something goes awry. Yeah, it, it's. I mean, it's. It's a really simple value proposition. Investing in compliance um, on the front end is is much more cost effective than responding to a compliance crisis on the back end. Um, we we've worked with one client who 
was, was a, a pretty good operator. They've been around for a while, and and they had you know pretty good a, a couple issues on on the compliance side. They they received a visit from state investigators where they identified some compliance issues. And you know, the operator had to bring in a law firm to respond to state allegations. They had to implement um, a new compliance program, additional training. And we're talking about tens of thousands of dollars on the back end, plus having the um, risk of losing a license, license due to the compliance violations when, for a fraction of it, you, know, you can put in the, the systems and trainings um, and implement that robust compliance program to ensure the violations don't happen. You know, whether you're self-auditing, you're bringing in a third party to come in and audit you, it's always going to be much more cost effective to identify your compliance issues um, before there's a problem than when you're responding to an actual complaint and allegation from the government. And that's not, and that's just responding to the investigation. Once once you know, a, a regulator decides to take um, action on a license, you're, it's just like any other lawsuit in, in the sense that you're potentially looking at six figures in regulatory defense just to keep your, your ticket to keep you know, working and, and running your cannabis business. So we, we strongly push for businesses to implement that robust compliance program on the front end. Yeah, I would just add, there's a, you know, you, you only have one chance to make a first impression, mm -hmm. and you have a certain amount of capital built up in your brand, uh, we, and, and what state regulators, what local authorities think of you, uh, eventually what federal authorities think of your business, it, it, it matters. And, and if you, 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 you don't get a lot of chances at this. So I can tell you the biggest challenge we face when we get a serious compliance problem is if it's, if it's the first time there's a chance to show prompt, serious, corrective action and say, you know, we made a mistake, we were fixing it. But on the second time, on the third time, you, you just don't, there's not an unlimited well to keep going back to. And so it's a lot, uh, to Aaron's point, it's just, it's a lot, it's smarter to do this up front and make sure that you're in a position to retain that, that brand integrity. And operationally, I've seen it uh, work where it does mean something to the agencies when they come in to do an inspection and they identify problems and the operator pulls out their internal audit report or their internal corrective action plan or their internal SOP and says, oh, well, this is what we had and this is what we're doing and this is what we submitted to you and how can we correct this? So it does mean a lot to them to know that even the operators, the, the boots on the ground down to the, the retail counter workers or whoever, whoever's position it is has a cognizance of what are the rules, where are we meeting these requirements, where are we not meeting the requirements, what are we still working on. So it does become critical again in that training that because they'll do, the inspectors are, are interesting where they will kind of come in and find the person hiding in the corner and go, you, you tell me what you're doing. <laughs> you know, I want to know your job um, to understand really what is the, you know, the operating level of each person who's working at this facility, because it is so critical uh, that every single person is participating in creating this compliant environment. Julie, let's stick with you for a minute. I, I love picking on you. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the how and the why of compliance violations, where, you know, if it's a local official, if it's a state regulator, whatever, people are coming in, they're finding that guy in the corner and asking him what he's done or what he does. Uh, how and why do violations occur? I think, uh, guys, am I right? You guys probably want to know why these things happen, no? Well, Julie, go ahead anyways. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's, again, it's so interesting because I do feel like just as we're talking about training for uh, operators and for licensees, you have local and state governments that are going through their own training processes for training their own staff. So, you know, in every state right now, there's RFPs going out for how are we going to train our local enforcement so that they understand what they're looking at and what they're looking for when they walk into these environments. So it, it is such an interesting time because there's so much subjectivity as well, which is n never fun. Uh, so that so that when you have you know you might have some you know get up and go inspector who's going to come in and he's got the, and on his list today that he's going to take somebody down you know and you just don't know who you're who you're dealing with so it's really important 
you know, to kind of go through those drills and those practices for your staff and for everyone of how you're going to interface with, uh, with the enforcement agencies when they come. And we've already seen problems of people pretending to be enforcement agencies. So it's important to clarify with the enforcement agencies, how do they present themselves? What does their ID look like? Because you'll have a bud tender in a retail thing that gets all, you know, uh, fluffled when somebody comes in in a suit and says, I'm from the BCC, I want to see you're safe. When you're doing an audit, do you ever walk in and with like sheriff aviator glasses on and you're just like, show me, or uh, I'm- One of the joys of my life is just messing with people. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, um, I mean, it's, it's really, an, in, I mean, again, it's just an interesting process to take people through. So, so one of the things, I mean, one of the things that we work very, very hard with in our position kind of as consultants, because we have these multi-tiered relationships where I have really great relationships with the local agencies, with the state agencies, to be able to kind of get into their intent as a, as a non-licensee mm -hmm. to understand what are their enforcement priorities. And here's a list of 100 regulations that you have to comply with, but here's the 22 things that are actually on their inspection sheet. So that's really critical for a business to know that if you're going to pick 22 things to like really have a gold star on, it's going to be the things on their inspection sheet. And so keeping up with those enforcement priorities, understanding what's important for the different license types to, to their, um, like what are those critical checkpoints? What are you know, the things that they're not gonna let slide where, yeah, maybe they don't mind if, you're, if your windows don't have 50% you know, transparency, but if your sanitation procedures aren't up to spec, you're in big trouble. It, so I think those things are really a big part of how we work with people is in being able to build your program responsively to those enforcement priorities, because that's ultimately who you're dealing with. Clint, what have you seen with your team in terms of training, com training companies, clients, in terms of auditing? Sure. I would probably say why compliance comes up is because people make mistakes. And because of that, you're going to have a plethora of issues that happen. And one of the major issues that I see is that if you're working in cannabis and you have a cultivation center, an extraction center, and you have these employees operating the mach these machines, in this case cannabis, prob there's probably a high percentage of those individuals actually actively using cannabis while at the job. And just how we prohibit the use of alcohol while operating heavy machinery, you can't have people under the influence of cannabis doing this as well. And once that occurs, once a simple injury or a, a situation occurs, you have all the agencies coming in, right? Yeah. And so if you have an amputation or anything of that nature, this is going to come up. And so you have to make sure that you have a program in place on how you actually hire these employees. What's your drug and alcohol program look like? How are you actually going to run a background check on these individuals and run a drug test? Are you testing for all cannabis compounds in, in their system when it actually pops up? And after the injury, are you going to go and drug test them again? What else are they on? And is, is the actual insurance carrier going to go in and say, hey, I'm going to insure this, you know, because, you know, they, they weren't high or they were high on the job. And so these, these aspects come up. And what we do is, or what I do is, is I try and go in there and train people on there and ask them, hey, what does your illness injury prevention program look like? What are you actually proactively doing to making sure that these mistakes aren't going to occur and that people aren't showing up high on the job? Yeah, because folks, just to be clear, this write this down in your notepads. Don't hire people who are high on the job. <laughs> this is compliance 101. That's a freebie. Yeah. You know, ask us more questions afterwards, but. <laughs> I just want to it's highly add, overlooked, though. Add to what it, absolutely. Was saying, and I th it's something we see a lot, at, at least on, on the employee level. Most compliance violations aren't malicious. Mm -hmm. You know, folks aren't showing up to work with the intention that, you know, they're just going to flout the rules and, and do what they want to do. It, it really is a result of, of a lack of systems, a lack of, of training, and to make sure that workers understand the regulation. One of the things we've seen, even with some of the most prominent cannabis companies, is that you know, when the end of the month is coming along and, and folks are paying attention to sales figures, oftentimes you know, compliance takes a, a backseat to hitting end of the month numbers. Yeah. And, and that's a, a huge mistake. 
Um, you know, as executives and management, you know, the, the, the culture of compliance starts at the top and works its way down. And, and while in the short term you may be hitting your, your numbers for the month or the quarter or whatever time period we're looking at, long term it's, it's not going to be a sustainable model because ultimately the compliance violations catch up to the business. Penny wise, pound foolish, just like uh, Mayor Daly's billion dollar uh, parking deal for Chicagoans of a long time. <laughs> never, never mind. Um, to go off that point, though, from a manufacturing perspective, at the what I see is at the end of the very month, you see complete chaos and everyone's frantic and they're just trying to push product out, and uh, that's where you start to see mistakes happen. You see it with forklift drivers. People, I've, I've seen people run people over. Um, they're just trying to get the product out the door to 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 meet the numbers, you know. And so you want to make sure that you're taking things step by step and you're just not pushing things out the door as quickly as possible because that and those are the instances where big mistakes happen and then all of a sudden the compliance umbrella opens up. Exuberance and enthusiasm is one thing. I'm getting this on a number of levels, on a macro level in terms of investors making sure that they're not rushing to the table and just signing anything and not doing their due diligence. But then it sounds like, Clint, what you're saying Enthusiasm and exuberance about sales, yeah. even in a warehouse situation, yeah, is kinda, well. It comes from the top to the bottom, right? So yeah. it's going to come down to the factory worker. Your factory worker is going to be the one pushing that product out, making sure that they get it out, and they are they're the machine that that makes it happen. Uh, folks, when we're talking about state and local officials, we're talking about uh, sort of the intermediate stage, right? It's not the short term, but it is immediate. But we're also, you know. If an investor is looking down the road, potentially at federal legalization as well, what do we think are some key aspects of compliance and how you know, things like the States Act are being integrated, things on, you know, in terms of what you need to be paying attention to from an investor standpoint, from a management standpoint for compliance? Julie, Aaron? Yeah, so we, we spend a lot of time. I do. I actually uh, uh, engage with um, some senior people at DEA and FDA, and we spend we spend a lot of time. I have I have some embarrassing white papers that we wrote years ago predicting what the Clinton the second the Clinton administration was going to look like and what their cannabis policy was going to be. But um, no, so we spend a lot of time on this question. And you alluded to the States Act. People should be paying a lot of attention here. Our assumption all along has been that at some point, um, you know, the, this this whole architecture of federal laws is going to, to change. We're going to see a rescheduling on the controlled substances list to move cannabis into a status where, uh, where the FDA can actually adopt a process. It's extremely unusual in the history of, uh, of products, of food, drug, cosmetic products, to have uh, the FDA basically standing down as it has been throughout the, the Cole Memorandum since 2013. So we're living in a very unusual time period. And I think you know, there's this possibility of the States Act uh, uh, proposed by the Warren campaign is an interesting idea that m perhaps will enshrine these state-by-state -state systems. But personally, I'm a skeptic. I, I, th I just think if you take a long view of how the FDA uh, has policed products, uh, drugs, botanicals, the whole range, food products, um, we, 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 we can fully expect that, that that's the infrastructure that ultimately we're going to have to live under. And so the question is, nobody knows exactly when um, the shift in law is going to happen, and more importantly, what the pathway is going to look like. Because it's not going to be as if Congress uh, votes and the president signs into law a new bill rescheduling cannabis, and then the next day you're going to be expected to live under a completely different regime. But what we expect is there will be a pathway, uh, a one to two year pathway, where you'll be expected to go from meeting the current you know, good manufacturing practices that the state of Illinois or whatever state you're operating in passes to all of a sudden having to do so under the FDA expectations. And so I think as you're building in this space, you need to be building in that respect. And to me, the critical thing you need to be paying attention to is it's going to take capital reserves to get through the FDA process, right? We, we work on a lot of these, uh, on the regulatory pathway for a lot of different kinds of, uh, of products. And, um, and it's not an inexpensive process to go through human safety testing if, if you're, if you're going to need approval, which most products will. The only, the only product category right now that seems to be promising for not having to do so is the cosmetic category. But I fully expect that there will be human safety testing, efficacy testing, and that's going to take uh, a, a lot of capital. And it's going to mean that you have to be building a product that's built for a larger market 
and that big hurdle that's coming, even though we don't know if it's, it's not next year because there's gonna be a multi-year pathway, but I, I, I would expect that within the next five to seven years, we're gonna see a shift to a federal system and you, you've gotta have that baked into your business plan. And I do think it's important to think from the compliance and enforcement perspective that when you are then looking at dealing with an agency like the FDA, you know, they have over double the enforcement budget of an agency like the DEA. <laughs> so, so they really have like a well-developed enforcement aspect to them as well, so that you're, you're gonna be in the crosshairs. And some companies already are, um, especially in the CBD markets where it's like the FDA is starting to target not just bigger egregious actors, but even just smaller players who are not playing by the rules. Uh, zooming back in on Illinois for a moment, gang, what do we think are some of the priorities that from an investment standpoint, from a management standpoint, what do we, where do we see in this intermediate stage, pre what Harry's talking about, but you know, uh, obviously J.B. Pritzker made, some, made a splash over the weekend. So if you're thinking about marijuana in Illinois in 2020, what are some steps that people can start to take today? I'm hearing crickets. <laughs> you know, I, I think the steps that people can be taking today, it, it, and it's the same, whether it's Illinois, New York, New Jersey, all of these proposals right now are fluid. And, and so it, it's, it's gathering capital. It's, it's, it's putting together your, your ownership team and making sure you're well capitalized and nimble. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's, interesting to start looking at real estate now because you know we've seen so much in, in other places that once laws and local ordinances become final real estate prices you know go through the roof and and so you know the, these times when you can get a, a location at market and and be able to hold on to it put a different business in for the time being I, I think that's smart but ultimately from you know what we've seen with New York and New Jersey that it, that it's great that that the governor came out with with a solution let's let's see what it, the final product looks like and if there's going to be a final product in the meantime though I, I would just same to any other state it would just be get your capital together because this is an expensive undertaking I also think it's critical to um, deeply engage to, with these political and rulemaking processes as these rules are being written. Because I think uh, California is, an is a great example right now of unintended consequences sometimes of some of these rulemaking packages where, where it's so critical to have a lot of informed eyes on these local ordinances, on how they interface with state ordinances, on how state might in influence federal ordinances and really be kind of plotting that long game from the beginning um, to make sure that you're not ending up with a local ordinance or a state set of regulations that's going to uh, prevent growth, prevent innovation, prevent diversity, prevent access, like that those things kind of have to be baked into it because some of that is what we're coming up against, but there's a lot of great ideas, but sometimes um, in especially too looking at as they're setting these tax rates and what the local tax structures will be and making sure that that's not um, gonna be over overreaching and sink the ship in advance because uh, we're seeing a lot of that play out where you have a lot of uh, hands in the bucket where between local taxes and state taxes and excise taxes and the looming prospect of a federal excise tax of you know there's kind of only so much that a market can bear in those situations. Aaron, I have a, a specific question. I, I think for you, anyone really, but I'm asking my boss. Uh, what do we think in terms of Illinois, you know, from a policy standpoint, because Julie is absolutely right, about policy and being at that table in terms of getting those rules, those regulations drawn up. Uh, so where can people inside the state of Illinois, the land of Lincoln, where can they turn to? I mean, do they, do they seek out people in other states? Do they seek out people in California? What's the best way to go? Where you've, you've done work in California, obviously, but other, other, where, other wares as well. A yeah, so work. listen, at, at, at this point, I, I think it's best for, for folks to you know, engage lobbyists if they want to be involved in the political process or get involved with like trade groups because the, the trade groups who, who are representing multiple stakeholders, you know, they, they enjoy a, a unique spot at the rulemaking table because they represent so many stakeholders 
and they have this industry expertise that um, folks in government don't necessarily have at this point. Um, I I've been surprised over the years the amount of uh, influence that these trade groups have when working with state officials and coming up with cannabis policy. And you know, this is, this is really the time to shape the conversation. You know, New York has been, has been very vocal about having a strong social equity program, allowing folks who have been impacted by the war on drugs to benefit from cannabis licensure. We're doing a number of projects in Missouri, and, and in Missouri there is no talk about social equity. It's, it's merely an exercise in capitalism. And so, you know, here when we're at this proposal stage it is, is when, you know, folks can weigh in on this conversation of what do we want the Illinois cannabis program to look like? What, what policies and priorities are important to us? To us? And, and, you know, the, there, there's a lot of benefit to having numbers when you go to a state capital and, and weigh in on these issues. Great. Um. Uh, anyways, we can't thank you guys enough for your rapt attention at our compliance panel. I'd like to thank Aaron, Julie, Harry, Clint, all of you for joining us up on stage. We will be mingling about. Uh, so if you have questions, reach out. Follow us on LinkedIn. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.